Trail and Ultra Runners, what is going on? What's happening? Welcome to another episode of the Coopcast. Welcome to the last episode in the series of podcasts that I've had over the last five weeks, all having to do with anti-doping solutions and anti-doping issues in the sport of trail and ultra running. It has been a really fun ride over the course of the last five weeks and a really fun ride over the course of the last year of me trying to get these podcasts together. Really extra special thanks to all the guests that have come before this particular podcast, Dr. Fedora, Paul Demio, Lisa Roberts, Charlie Rare, Charlie Ware, and finally, this conversation I have with one of my athletes, Dylan Bowman, and fellow coach, Mario Fraioli. I love hanging out with Mario at the races because I really like his coaching attitude and his, and his coaching framework. What I wanted to set up with this conversation is a template. And it's a template for a brainstorm that everybody else can have out there. What do we want solutions to look like going forward? As I've made the case in many podcasts before this, nobody is going to save us. Nobody is going to swoop in and adopt trail and ultra running into their current rule set with very, very, very few fringe exceptions. It's going to be up to us as a community to galvanize, to come together, to forge some type of solution. And I wanted this conversation that I had with these two fine individuals to serve as a template to go forward. I also hope that not only this podcast, but the entire series of podcasts inspires people to partake in the process. As we learned from Charlie, this stuff is hard. It requires a lot of effort. It's a shit job with no pay. It's subject to a lot of criticism in doing the actual work is the limiting factor. So if you get fired up from listening to this podcast, take action, get people on your side. People will want to help. We all need to kind of come together and do it. And that's including myself. That's including athletes. That's including sponsors and brands and races, all the critical stakeholders. We talk a lot about that during this podcast. Before we get into it, one final thing, I realize that it is a little bit of a sausage fest. I'm sorry for that vocabulary. It's the first thing that came to mind. I realize it's a bunch of dudes in the room. I really did try to bring some women in the room for this. I reached out to four different women to try to get their perspectives, and we all had scheduling conflicts, and this is just what came about. I will do better. I will try harder next time. You guys know that I always try to present that balance on this podcast, and I did not do a good job of it this time, despite my best efforts. But... It's still an awesome conversation. We're gonna get right into it. I'm getting out of the way. Here's my conversation with Dylan Bowman and Mario Fraioli. I I literally just left USADA, like literally 10 minutes ago. Oh, really? I I drove, yep, I drove straight back here and I set up my equipment here and I'm doing this. So it's all kind of like fresh on my mind. Well, let's do it then, huh? Let's dive in. Yep. Um, So when I set the series of this up, I was the most excited for this part of it because I always felt that it was going to be the most practical because a lot of times when you set these situations up, you work from, you work from theory to practice, right? How do you want to set up things philosophically, gather all the background information in the vein of a lot of the earlier podcasts that, that, uh, that I recorded that the listeners will have you know, access to before this one comes out, is it's a lot of information gathering, right? It's kind of an educational vein where we're just trying to educate a public who doesn't have a whole lot of exposure to these types of issues. The, the tack that I was trying to take throughout the first several podcasts was just to lay that foundational education work. And one of the things that particularly came out with the conversation with Dr. Fedorik was that that has to be a big part of any sort of initial attempts is you have to educate the athletes first and foremost, but also the public at large. And you can't ever do enough of it. And he gave this great example where when they, uh, when they took over the UFC program, they basically took six months, six months, of putting the athletes through everything that they would normally go through whereabouts program. You got to submit to testing and all that other stuff in a no fault setting, meaning they could trip positive tests and things like that. And they would have no fault. And the whole vein of that was a big educational piece just so the athletes would learn, okay, here's what I have to do. Here's how I have to file my whereabouts. Here's you know, this supplement is going to trip the test and all like just to get the educational framework 
going, which is so inherently problematic. So, but this conversation to get down to brass tacks, I think is going to be really practical, right? So I'm going to ask two people's who, two, two people's opinions who I respect a lot. What does this actually look like? Like if we could wave magic wands and, you know, pull money out of our ears and things like that, what thing, what things would we put together as a community uh, to try to, to try to get some, some efforts going, but I don't want to take that as the default, right? I asked you guys to think about this in advance of the, of the podcast. I think the, the first thing that we need to think about is, do we even want to do this? Is there a need to do it? And is the sports better served having some sort of concentrated effort to muster up the will to have some sort of anti-doping policy towards it. And Mario, I'm going to ask you to go first on this one. I think so. I think there needs to be. And I understand the various challenges involved in setting something up like that, especially in ultra running, which is so vast and varied in so many different ways. But I do think the sport is at a point now, and it got to this point in the last several years where it's certainly getting more competitive and robust. There's a lot more money coming into it on the professional side of the sport, whether that's through sponsorships, prize money in different places. Dylan and I talked this week on his podcast about, you know, this new world series that's coming in. And if they're going to start paying athletes to be a part of that, potentially Spartans already doing it. And I think because of, of those factors and where we are right now, there needs to be something cohesive or at least a cohesive discussion amongst key stakeholders in the sport as to what an effective anti-doping program could look like and what parts of the sport it should touch. Debo. Your thoughts. Do you so, want to do this? So you're the athlete. You're the athlete. You'd have to like piss in a cup and have a phlebotomist come over to your house and jab <laughs> you in the arm and take some blood away from you. Like you have to, you theor theoretically have to live the ramifications of this day in and day out, which is not easy as an athlete. There's a lot of athletes that just don't like this whole process. I think it's a sacrifice that you have to be willing to make if you want to have the amazing life of being a professional athlete. Of course, it's not glamorous to get out of bed in your underwear to a doorbell to pee in a cup in front of some stranger. Uh, but I, I think the important thing to mention from my perspective as somebody who has been racing professionally now for a long time is that I have almost never been drug tested in a real way. And the couple of times that I have been tested have been Bush league at best to the point where I actually have been very angry leaving it, knowing that my career is in the hands of these people. My reputation is in the hands of these people. And you guys are much more educated on this subject than I am. But when that's the case, and you feel as if your reputation is on the line and you clearly see that it's an inept process that's being run, it's really disconcerting. And um, so, you know, from my perspective, I would love to have a very uh, sophisticated anti-doping program. I would happily do my whereabouts all the time or as much as is relevant and necessary. Um, but yeah, that, that hasn't been the case so far. And uh I think you know to the overarching question of do we do we need this? I think you know Mario was right on in that this is a good time for this to actually uh, come into existence as the sport is really reaching a new level of maturity and a new level of professionalization. And um, the question is just you know how we go about doing it. Uh, mm -hmm. Me personally, I um, still believe in my heart that the sport is very clean. I think there's probably some people who don't feel that way. Um, that's, I have confidence in that fact. Uh, that's how I sleep at night. And, uh, I think a lot of that has to do with a lot of the things that Mario and I talked about on our podcast this week and just the culture and the spirit of the sport. And, uh, I'm not naive enough to think that that could never be corrupted and that there aren't 
you know, rare cases of people that are, are cheating. Um, but I think we're, we're, we'd be wise as a community, as a sport to get out in front of it and to actually get so, something like this up and running. I'm glad you mentioned that last part, Dylan, because, you know, you bring this up and it automatically conjures up images or it could lead people to believe that you think something is a foul that you then have to fix. And I, I agree with you that I think by and large and by, by large, 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 however bigger that is, <laughs> um, there, there are not, there's not a lot of cheating going on at this moment in time. However, however, that proposition is never static in sport. It is mm -hmm. always changing. And typically when there is typically when the incentives go up, meaning the financial incentives, the, the ego incentives, all those different types of incentives of why people compete against each other. It's not just financial. There's other pieces of it, but when those incentives go up, the incentive to cheat in its various formats, doping, just being one of them, also go up. So your point about the inflection, I think is really well taken because it, it's, it's not, that's my dog. She's going to interrupt us a couple of times, <laughs> by the way. Um, it's not, I mean, it's, it could very easily go awry at this point. And I do think that there are, we're already seeing kind of the writing on the wall of this ship that's not going to be able to get turned around at some point where the professionalism continues to be increased, 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 and increased. And I will also say, so I agree with both of you guys, but I'm going to ask Mario, if you want to think about this for a little bit to give us like the devil's advocate perspective, because you kind of see it play out from a track and, uh, mainly from a track and field and marathon marathoning perspective where, you know, who knows how effective these solutions can actually be. But I don't mind saying that, getting some sort of anti-doping uh, rules and regulation and framework together is a selfish endeavor for me because I make my living in the sport and I like making my living in the sport. I think it's a fantastic career that I just happened to, you know, stumble upon and carve out and things like that. It behooves me as a professional to have more professionalism in the sport. I raise my hand and I wholeheart I wholeheartedly admit that there is absolutely economic personal economic incentive for me to try to get the to try to get th this and other things kind of in place. And I don't mind saying that. I think that it's good for the gander. I think that the mm -hmm. whole sport if we look at 10 years from now, we talked about this offline. Talked about uh, if we look at the whole sport 10 years from now, and that's the lens that we have to have with these types of efforts we're going to be better off having done something now than just putting the blindfold on like nothing's going to change. So we all agree here. We need to do something, but I, I want to kind of like represent the, I don't know. I don't know what category to put these people in there, but there are going to be like skeptics out there that say, ah, oh, we don't need this. The sport doesn't need it. It's becoming too professionalized, blah, 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 blah. Mario, can you try to, can, can you try to like encapsulate that point of mm -hmm. view for people just so that we're giving a little bit of a balance to things? Yeah. I mean, I, my initial reaction when I hear you say that, I think that's exactly why we need it. And I think it's because of that 10 year view. And I think those of us, those of us who have been involved in the sport long enough as both of you have, um, and have a hand in the professional side of it as we all have, and for me personally, knowing what I know about track and field and road racing and some of the challenges that they faced on that side of things, better to get the ball rolling on that now because we can see where it's going to go. Um, and if we don't get ahead of it, it's only going to be harder to implement stuff like this in the future. And to the point that Dylan made, which I think is a very important one, there needs to be confidence from the athletes especially but also coaches and race directors and everyone else who's involved that this is being done right that there is a comprehensiveness to it that there's a consistency to it across the board because without that there's going to be no confidence and it's going to be harder to put that in place so i think based on what history has shown us in other sports and where we can see ultra running going like now is now is the time to start doing this. And I don't know what the perfect solution is. And we can talk about that as, as this conversation goes on. And it's not something 
that's going to be figured out overnight, but I do think this discussion needs to be needs to be had and some key pieces need to start being put into place. Well, you I don't know if that answers that, your initial yeah, inquiry, but well, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard, it's hard to pre present. I don't, the, we see the shit show in cycling like mm -hmm. that in the early two thousands and the mid two thousands was a total shit show, even though, you know, USADA started in the year to, it started in the year 2000 and supposedly was going to kind of clamp down on this. But to your point, Mario, of it becomes the boulder gets bigger and has momentum, the longer it starts rolling downhill. And if you catch it at the very top before it gets all of that momentum and inertia, it's a whole lot easier to stop and turn around and slow down exactly. and kind of put the brakes on and things like that. At a certain point, it just gets so big that the whole thing needs to get blown up before you can start to create a reasonable dent in things. And that is exactly what happened in cycling. I mean, to yeah. the T, they had to blow the whole thing up and they're still dealing with it. And I think going back to that 10 year lens, 10 years from now, if we end up like cycling and didn't do anything about it, we being the ultra running community, end up like cycling and we didn't do anything about it, we're all gonna kick ourselves, just like they're mm -hmm. all kicking themselves right now. They're all, every single one of them, and I know a lot of them just because of my employment history and things like that. They are all, and they're public about it. They're all like, we screwed up. This is how we screwed up. We all screwed up as a community, like every single one of us with very, very few exceptions. And we would all be remiss if we didn't look at that and go, that could happen in this community very easily because it's got all the telltale signs. Yeah, there's a there's certainly a lesson to be learned there. And I, I think that Boulder analogy is, is on the money. Um, we're at a point now where it, it's not so big and it's not moving so fast that it can't be slowed down. But 10 years from now, seeing where this sport is going with the number of people who are coming into it, the number of people who are trying to make a professional go at it as athletes, um, the amount of money that's coming into it, as you mentioned, ego, all of these other things. Um, I mean, it, it's to me, I mean, I don't want to sound like a, like a, like I have a crystal ball or I'm a prophet or something like that, but I, I can see where this is going. Um, but I can also, I also understand that the sport by and large has not taken any real steps to address this. And, and I'm glad that we're talking about it. Yeah. With all due respect to Charlie and, uh, he put a tremendous amount of effort into getting some framework, which I think is a good framework, uh, that he initially uh, started out. It was like you said, there's not, there hasn't been a lot of wholehearted attempts at it. So let, let's switch gears a little bit, Dylan, this is like your time to shine because you've been through it and you, you've already said that it doesn't give you a lot of confidence. Part of the, part of the issue with trail and ultra running right now is that nothing exists. If an athlete goes through the collegiate track and field rate ranks and then goes and starts to race professionally they get adopted into the framework that exists at the Olympic level, at the USADA level, at USA track and field level. They don't have any choice, right? They just, it's just part of the gig when they take on that profession. There's a blessing and a curse with not having to do that, right? The blessing is, is we can do whatever we want to as a community. The curse is we have to do everything. We have to do everything ourselves. So big picture, Dylan, what does it look like? Like, what does the solution like? I, I know this is loaded and you could go on for another two hours on this, but like what fundamentally would an anti-doping solution look like in the, in the community? You know, I feel kind of silly having this conversation with you guys because I feel like you guys know so much more about this stuff than I do. And it's But you're an athlete, sad, you're an right? athlete. It, like that's, what that's do you want to see? That's my yeah. point. My point is that you know, as I mentioned in the first uh, question, I've been tested two or three times over the course of my career in like a real way. And both of those times have left me feeling violated in that it was totally unprofessional, totally not to the standard. Uh, and even though I just said, I'm not as educated on the subject as you guys are, I'm educated to know well enough uh, how, how some of the protocols happen. For example, there needs to be a B sample. In my case, there was never a B sample. There needs to be somebody in the room watching you. There was nobody in the room watching me. And so when I was handing over my urine and my, and they took my blood, I thought, this is my freaking career in your guys' hands. This is my reputation. And if this comes back showing something that is clearly not true and 
you guys have done this in a way that's unprofessional, my life is ruined, right? And it's profoundly upsetting in, in that circumstance. And so I don't know, the, the way that I would answer the question, Coop, would actually maybe be to, to ask you a question. And so obviously for me as an athlete, I would love to see the real testing happen, right? Out of competition, random whereabouts, all that stuff. So to your question of how, how does it look? It'd be great if it could look like that. I have no idea what that costs. I have no idea what the implications are and who does it or whatever. But you guys are just talking about cycling. And I think, you know, Coop, you and I are both fans of the UFC. And the UFC had a situation several years ago where they clearly had a problem with performance enhancing drugs. And they, and I sort of see this similar, obviously ultra running at a much smaller scale, but that was at a moment in time when the UFC was really struggling to be taken seriously as a sport. And I feel like trail and ultra running now is in the same place where, okay, we've got this growth, we've got these new partnerships, et cetera, and we're starting to want to be taken seriously as well. And in order to do so, you have to have trust that the results of the competition are fair. And so the UFC implemented a very high budget, very high tech, uh, very rigorous anti-doping program. And I'm sure Coop, you know more than me. So really I I'd love to hear you maybe talk about that because I mean, honestly, the analog I think is, is, is kind of similar. I mean, it's not obviously ultra running is not at the same level that UFC was when they did this, but the UFC had a bit of a problem. And, uh, you know, people talk about those wild west days when guys were all on, you know, whatever they it was on. messed up. Yeah, it was messed up. And I, I mean, I, I've had a little bit of a front door seat to, you know, how that program went down with a lot of my mutual colleagues. And it was not, it, it was one of those things that's very hard at the beginning, because there was mm -hmm. a cultural, there was a big cultural problem within that sport. Um, let's face it. It's not the most educated group of athletes. I think they would readily admit that. And I think the kind of the results of what they went through, uh, demonstrate that as well. And there was a lot of resistance to, uh, to, to implementing those policies. So you combine those in the concoction of it. It was, it was just very hard, but we look at it now, once again, with a 10 year lens, look back on it and the degree of professionalism that do that doing something like that race that wasn't the only thing but that was a big thing in that sports trajectory where we can now look back on it and go yep they went from kind of backyard brawling unregulated and adopted all of these regulations not just the anti-doping thing and put them on a sporting pedestal where it's the it's the first thing I click on when I go to ESPN because it's on the top bar. It's on the top bar of ESPN. Yep. Who would have ever thought that five years ago? Nobody was thinking that, but somehow this was, that was a big part of it. What I'm hearing from you, Dylan, though, is that it ha the athletes have to have confidence in the system. And this is a big thing that has been brought up in some of the earlier attempts from Charlie and actually got brought up in uh, my conversation with Dr. Fedoric over at USADA, where the athletes have to have confidence on both sides. They have to have confidence in the results and the results management process, as you, were, as you mentioned, Dylan, but they also have to have confidence in the efficacious nature, efficacious nature of the anti-doping controls that they're actually catching cheaters. And those two things are both simultaneously very, very, very difficult to do. But it's a key part because you don't, the athletes, and this, I received a lot of this feedback from previous anti doping efforts. They want to feel that all of the pain in the ass stuff that they have to go through, waking up at 6 a.m., having somebody stab them with a needle, peeing in a cup in front of some stranger, having the worry in the back of their heads of if this medication is going to produce, you know, some adverse finding and having to go through that process. They want to have confidence that all of it, all of that is worth it. And part of the educational process that organ organizations like USADA go through, and I'm not advocating that USADA is the end all be all answer or anything like that. But part of the process they go through is to educate the athletes on that trajectory, on what happens when 
this whole run of show starts to starts to go down in order to enable confidence in the athletes so that they know that they're taken care of they're going to be well represented that they're catching the people or trying to catch the people at least that are that are legitimately cheating that whole thing and it's such a big part that i think a lot of the hesitancy doesn't have anything to do with i want to trip a i'm going to trip a false positive or anything like that the hesitancy a lot of it comes from is the effort going to be worth it at the end of the day and that's a big that that that's a just a big un, unanswered question um Mario, you've seen it from track and field and road running side, and you've seen like the failures and the successes of these programs, all of which publicly play out in every salacious manner possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we, we can have a blank slate, right? I mean, trail and ultra running doesn't have to get adopted into USA track and fields rules. We don't have to get adopted into USA cycling rules or anything else. We can kind of like do whatever, whatever the heck we want to do at the end of the day. So I mean, if you had the blank slate seeing all the successes and failures, like what does it look like to you? I'll answer that, but I'll preface it by saying this is where I get confused and I'm at a little bit of a loss because in, let's just call it ultra running. And I think that includes trail ultra running, but you've also got to include, yeah. you know, road racing where you've got national and world championships. Um, you know, you've got private series and corporations now uh, multiple ones that are going to operate independently of one another and have their own path to their own you know private world championship um ostensibly you're going to have athletes who are committed to one of those series maybe they bounce back and forth you know between a few of them and at least as of right now there is no central governing body of any sort that can say to all of these different constituencies, Hey, this is the program. Here's how we're going to implement it across all these various domains. So I, I think something needs to be established for, for ultra running, which admittedly, and, and I think this is a big difference from track and field and road racing is a much bigger umbrella. You've just got, I mean, numbers wise in terms of, you know, the participants and professionalization of the sport. Yes, it's, it's a lot smaller, but in terms of just the different disciplines and events and how different the sport is in Europe versus here in the States versus in, in Asia and governing bodies. Like, I, I think that's where it gets, that's where it gets hard. So, so I think just identifying like what that, what that governing body or that unifying organization is going to be that can say, you know, Hey, here, here, here are the rules. Um, because it, it is just so, it is just so all over the place. I mean, I was looking at, you know, the, the Western States policy, which I think we we're going to talk about later in, in this conversation. And they're going basically by, you know, I think it's, it's USADA, WADA and USATF, guidelines if i'm if i'm not mistaken as as i read it i like basically wada you know wada guidelines and usada guidelines which are um fairly consistent so i think there needs to be first like an establishment of an ultra running governing body with buy-in from all of these different series and disciplines and i don't think that would be a real easy thing to do um but i think that's where it needs to start because that's how you're going to have some consistency and i think from consistency comes confidence from the athletes as you just talked about in terms of not only what's happening to their sample or how the program works but that it it's it's a worthwhile thing for them um so i i think that's the i think that's the most important piece of the puzzle and everything else is going to stem from there in terms of you know who's who's in the testing pool um because i do think there needs to be an out of competition testing pool like what events are going to have drug testing on site post race for the top finishers what does that look like um and and also i i don't think athletes and you've alluded to this a few times should be surprised by any of this like i think anyone who you know could potentially be uh up for up for drug testing like it, it shouldn't come as a surprise for them like they should they should know that this is part of the sport now and it's part of their jobs as 
as professional athletes. And because of that, they can, they can trust in the, the system and the people and protocols that have been put into place. So Mario wants consistency. Dylan wants professionalism. I'm going to ping off of the consistency piece a little bit, and you guys might be too young to remember this, but I, I am not. Um, bef bef way before USADA, it was up to basically each individual sport in each country to figure mm -hmm. this out. So you can imagine a world where USA Tennis says, okay, we're going to, we think that these things are prohibited. And then you go over to South African tennis or British tennis or whatever, and they think, oh, well, we think that USA, they've got a pretty good program, but we're going to add on these things and we're going to change the sanctioning a little bit. You multiply that inconsistency across hundreds of sports mm -hmm. and across hundreds of countries. It's extremely problematic for the athletes to try to comply with that level of inconsistency when their careers are on the line to, to, exactly. to Dylan's point. So to have this, I, I 100% wholeheartedly agree with your sentiment, Mario, that this overarching umbrella that says, here are the rules that are going to be applied consistently across all of these different race formats. It might not be the perfect set of rules initially, but a consistent set is going to be more effective in the long term than the perfect set because you can get everybody on the same page. And then if you need to insert a line item on one of those pages, great. Everybody can get on the same, or get, a, get everybody in the same book. I'll use that analogy since I just got done recording my audio book. You'll get everybody reading from the same book. And then if you need to change a page in the book, you say, just like WADA does every year, we're gonna change this page in the book. Mm -hmm. We're gonna get everybody on the same, we're gonna get everybody reading from the same playbook. Okay, this is the new, this is kind of the new set of rules. If you start out fractured and then bring it back and then try to bring it back together, that's when it's everything is Yeah, it's really, really, really problematic and it takes another 10 years. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And that's the important thing to remember too. It's not going to be perfect out yes. the gate. Nothing is. Yes. And, and as time goes on and various things develop to your point like there are going to be addendums that need to be made there are going to be adjustments for you know a world championship road racing ultra perhaps versus the finale of a private series uh, just to use a, a totally random analogy i don't know exactly how they they differ but i i imagine that they they certainly would um so I, I do think I do think you're right. If it starts fractured, it's going to be impossible to put all of those pieces together. But if you have something that's cohesive when it comes out, you can identify various flaws in in parts of it and and adjust. And people are going to know when those adjustments happen because they they should be well documented and established. The the playing devil's advocate on the consistency piece of it. One of the issues that that inherently contains is the initial filter is, is not fine enough. You're not gonna catch all of the cheaters because you're trying to create an overarching set of rules mm -hmm. that can get watered down when you have that consistency. I mean, that's the ultimate balance between trying to get everybody, trying to compromise, right? Getting everybody on the same page versus exactly what everybody wants. I want to know what Dylan thinks about that particular aspect, because that's an athlete practical thing. If you start out with the solution that you know has holes in the filter to give you confidence to, to, to your point, Dylan, how does that then affect that? Well, I mean, I agree with both of you guys. I think something is always better than nothing. And the anti-doping efforts that are, taking place within the sport are largely symbolic. And that I think to your point is better than nothing, right? Like it, this is a solution, like a, a solution, a bandaid on a potential problem. Uh, but a band, uh, you know, a bandaid over a wound that, uh, probably needs, uh, an extra bandage, but at least it's something right. So I guess my, my point is like Western States has an anti-doping program, right? but anybody who's sophisticated enough to cheat 
is sophisticated enough to know how to show up at Western states being able to pass the test, right? But at least it's something, right? And so it's not perfect, but at least it's something. And I mean, yeah, to Mario's point, I think having a governing body, some sort of authority uh, that has credibility that um, you know people can look to and trust that they've got the sport's best interests in mind would be a hugely, hugely valuable thing. And for them to take the leadership role in, in putting something like this together would be a dream come true for the sport. And so like the question is just, how do you go about doing that? How, how does a governing body come into an existence and how do you take various stakeholders and get them to agree on who that governing body should be and how is it funded and who's paying for it? So it's a hugely complex issue, but I guess, you know, the, the something is better than nothing approach is, is definitely sort of the way I see it. And the courts program, which we haven't talked about, but is sort of like the most well-known anti-doping program within trail and ultra running is very much like a symbolic thing, right? It's them telling me, for those who are unfamiliar, who are listening, for example, um, when I was traveling to, to race, uh, usually on the ultra trail world tour, I would get an email about a week before the race, usually to say, Hey, go to a local lab within the next 48 hours and get basically a CBC blood test. And if there's, uh, sort of suspicious findings in the blood test, which I then would email to them, then potentially I would get a targeted doping, um, actual real drug test, not just a blood test. And, you know, for me, it made me feel nice. It was like, okay, well, at least they're, this is something. But again, the point is that for those who are sophisticated enough to cheat, it'd be very easy for them to get around that very unsophisticated symbolic level of quote unquote anti-doping. So I would love to see consistency to uh, what you guys are talking about. The problem is just figuring out how do we agree on what that consistency is and who's paying for it. My issue with that story, Dylan, though, not with the story itself, but with like this series of events in the way that Quartz is set up. And I'm not saying this to throw a Quartz underneath the bus. I'm not a fan of theirs. I don't mind admitting it. I don't, I don't think that they have very good policy or practice nor people behind that organization. And I don't, and I don't mind saying that I've been very, very openly critical about them for a long time now but my real issue is for you as an athlete you don't know what an adverse finding is you have no idea because they have no publicly recognized standards for that so if i go on wada's website i go on the global dro right the drug reference online i can look up any drug in the world and say yeah. you know what it's tolerated within these limits it's not tolerated at all. It's tolerated in or out of competition. I can find that framework very easily mm -hmm. for courts to say, and this is my biggest issue with them. If you have an adverse finding of which there is no definition that you can find, that is very problematic. And that does not give athletes a lot of confidence. And I would look at that and go, well, what's adverse? I'm not cheating, but I still want to know what's adverse or not, because I don't want six months from now, you guys coming back and saying, oh, we found something adverse. So what does adverse mean? Totally. So I think what, what, like, what is that? Probably what they're looking for is the textbook example you read from the old cycling books of your hematocrit being over 50% or, or whatever. Which would be, which would be fine. Right. If they said, this is what it is. Of course. And that's my issue is like, there's no definition of quote unquote adverse. And yeah. that goes back to the consistency aspect. Yeah. Listen, I, I totally agree. It, it feels Bush league. It feels low budget and it feels symbolic, right? Um, but Coop, I guess it brings up something that, um, you know, you kind of brought into my life as my longtime coach. And that is the WADA um, database of banned substances and stuff. And I remember, I can't remember what it was. I think it was like when I got bit by a tick and they put me on <laughs> antibiotics or something. <laughs> yeah. And I called you or something just to let you know that, you know, I was going to take a couple of days off from training or something. And you said, so what did they give you? And I said, oh, well, you know, whatever it was, I forget, try or what was it? I can't remember the name of the antibiotic, but you, 
you, know, you said, hey, you need to develop the habit of going and looking on this website to see what these drugs are and if they're banned in competition. I, it would have never occurred to me because it was just prescribed to me by a doctor and it didn't feel like something that would have been a performance answering drug. It turned out it was not on the banned substances list, but you helped me to develop that habit. Not that I really have ever taken many uh, prescription drugs. This was a unusual uh, case of being bit by a tick, but I think it's important for people who are listening, you know, who are aspiring professionals and want to approach the sport in an honest way to develop that habit as well. So maybe you, that's something you could put in the show notes, just whatever that, uh, that resource is on the WADA website where you can look those banned substances up. 100%. It's called the global DRO. Every athlete should have it bookmarked in their phone online. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to use across all sports. It has all of the scientific names of any drug that you want and all of the colloquial over the counter uh, names of any drug that you would ever want. It is a great resource. And even if you are not underneath of official anti-doping, whatever, but you might be athletes need to get into that habit. And I've been consistent with that with all of my athletes, even though very, very, very rarely do they fall underneath the, the, that type of umbrella. Because as you mentioned, people get tripped up in that a lot. I mean, that's part of the whole educational part for athletes is, is they just don't think, oh, my, you know, my, uh, I'm going to use an example that's outside of elite sport that is actually going on right now. So USA Cycling has the citizens program. And if you're a registered USA Cycling athlete and you go to your local criterium, you're competing in the 50 over, you know, category three, you know, race or whatever, they will randomly test people in those races. It would be the equivalent of going to the St. Patrick's Day 5K and, and you saw to picking out people, you know, that have, you know, green beer, you know, stains on their shirt or whatever <laughs> and testing those people, those athletes, those citizen athletes, even though they know that there's a remote possibility that they might get tested, they get tripped up all the time for just benign heart rate medications that their doctor prescribed them, something that, you know, that they don't even even kind of think about. And I use that as an example for elite athletes. Anything that you take, you got to run through the DRO. I just take, don't, don't even think twice about it. Anything over the counter, anything your doctor's prescribed you, run it through the DRO. And the listeners will remember my conversation with Lisa Roberts, which will be either one or two podcasts before this one. I can't remember. That's the mistake she made. That's the mm -hmm. exact mistake she made. She got prescribed a new medication. She didn't run through the DRO. She got popped for, you know, having that medication in her system. She, you saw it then came back and realized that that's what the mistake was and then sanctioned her appropriately. Mario can probably speak to that because that happens a lot in the track and field world, but it's, it's not without, uh, uh, it's not, it's not without its controversy because things like that are subject to be abused. Yeah. It's super controversial. I mean, it happened this week, a big piece came out just yesterday or the day before in the New York times about Brenda Martinez, who's a world championship medalist at the 800 meters. And she tested positive for a banned substance, which is banned because it's a, a masking agent and turns right. out it was because of a medication that she was taking to treat her depression. And, and, and it, as far as what I'm reading into it and Travis Tigart's explanation of it, like it, it's completely legit. And like one of the big discussions about that is like, well, if that's the case, should these things even be announced publicly? Because it was announced yeah, publicly as right. like, hey, she tripped this test, but we're not giving her any kind of a ban because it was found after doing the research that it was not that she, she wasn't trying to dope. Like she, you know, she was on, she was unaware. She was on this other medication that had nothing to do with, you know, ath athletic performance and didn't think twice about it. So, I mean, it, it's, it's definitely a, a controversial and complicated issue. And apparently at least reading, reading this article, I haven't dug too much deeper into it. This sort of thing happens. I don't want to say all the time, but more often than, you would think. And, you know, these, these announcements get made that, you know, Joe Smith tested positive, but it was found to be, I don't know, contaminated meat or something like whatever, whatever it could be. Um, and, and he's not going to face like a violation or something like that. So I think that's just a, that's another element of it that adds to just some of the, the messiness of, 
you know, of all of this. Um, and we've certainly seen instances of it, you know, in track and field cycling as well. Uh, and, you know, any pretty much, you know, any other sport where this sort of thing happens. Well, we've kind of batted back and forth a few of these key parts where it's consistency, integrity, um, solutions that can be implemented in a reasonable in a reasonable fashion so that we can all get on the same page not to put too big of a pun in the room but there is now the issue of who pays for it all right because it's not like money grows on trees or you know we're going to find a grant or anything like that i mean there's going to be some burden of 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 finances that somebody or some entities are going to have to incur and once again we can put that financial burden anywhere we want to we can make the athletes pay for it we can make the races pay for it. we can't make the athletes pay for it the athletes can choose to pay for it the races can choose to pay for it the sponsors can choose to pay for it nobody can pay for it and then nothing gets done but somebody's got to pay for it in order for anything to get done because nobody's going to do it for free right this stuff is depending upon your level of solution is varying in expense so Mario, like knowing what you know about how the NGBs work, what, where's a reasonable place to start? Who's going to kick it? Who's going to kick in for this stuff? It's such a complicated question because again, like there's nothing to unify all of this. So I think it, could feasibly be paid for in different ways. So one example, like I think of, right. In track and field and road racing, you've got world athletics, which is the sports governing body here in the U S you've got USADA. Um, other countries have their own version of an anti-doping association. It's under the umbrella of, of WADA. Um, you know, and, and that system, because people are competing, at largely like global championships and they are under under this umbrella there is like a cohesiveness to it there and i'm not totally sure exactly how that gets paid for i believe it's by i believe it's by the events but i'm not i'm not totally confident of that going into road racing i mean you've got and i'm thinking about this with some of the recent developments in ultra running you've got the world marathon majors series which is a series of of independently owned events but there is at the professional level someone who can be the annual champion of that and there's a you know there's a, a huge bonus that that goes along with that um and then obviously each individual race has prize purses and and whatnot but there is a within that series there is a a consistent anti-doping program and there are criteria that are in place you know for for those athletes and and i again, like, I don't know exactly who pays for it, but I believe it's, I believe it's, it's all of the events collectively who are like, yes, we're all in on this together and we're each contributing a, a certain amount of money. I mean, I think with a series like that, if you're going to be committed to anti-doping and having a, a program, you get all the events on the same page and you make it part of you make it part of the registration fee for the events or you take it from some of the sponsorship money that that comes in um if there were something like a, an athlete's union and they're paying dues to go into that i mean that's how the athletes could pay for it too i think there are multiple ways to do it i don't know what the perfect solution is um and i think there needs to be an even even wider discussion amongst you know race directors anti-doping officials, athletes themselves, maybe even some representation from, you know, common participants who are like, well, why is there, you know, another $5 on my entry fee, you know, to go pay for, you know, for, for anti-doping, um, and having that, you know, getting some understanding from all of, all of these different players. So I, I know I'm beating around the bush to answer your question. I, I don't know who pays for it. Um, I don't know let that there's an, this. Easy, let me ask you this, I don't know Mario. an easy answer to that question. Let, let me, let me ask you this directly though, right? You're, I would consider you a stakeholder, right? You coach athletes mm -hmm. in the ultra marathon space. Would you pay for it? Yes. hundred percent. Would you pull, would you pull money out of your pocket and say, here, put my, you know, put my hundred bucks into the pool to test people. Yep. Wouldn't even hesitate. I think that I, I'm going to skip ahead of you. That, on this that one feels like we'll the solution. Back. That feels like the solution, yeah. honestly, is crowdfunding it. 
Cause I think most of the athletes would be happy to kick in a few hundred bucks. I know you're talking to Charlie Ware about his idea, which was basically the same thing, getting athletes to, to chip in, to pay for their own testing. That feels like the solution to me is getting stakeholders to crowdfund. I, I, I agree. I think initially it has to be a good faith, uh, a good faith fundraise. And what I mean by good faith is, is we're kind of like, you know, building the bicycle as we're riding it <laughs> type of deal. It has to be a good faith fundraising by the stakeholders in the community. And what I mean by the stakeholders in the community, I mean, everybody, I mean, the athletes, mm -hmm. I mean, the coaches, myself, Mario, I'll put, I'll match you dollar for dollar. We can keep doing that until, <laughs> until we get this thing done. Um, the athletes, the coaches, the the races without I would add the I would add the part without the burden on passing that buck down to the common participant. I think that that's okay. important early on. Maybe they do it in an artificial way, and we can argue economics around that all day. But I think the brands need to play in this. If you're making your money, I guess what I'm trying to say is is if you're making your money or you have a stake in the space, in the sport. Mm -hmm. part of your obligation is to ensure the health of the entire ecosystem for years to come. I think that that's an obligation that everybody has in the space who plays in the spaces. You always have to leave it better than you found it, right? And this is an effort where everybody can leave it better than they find that than, than we found it when we came upon it. And part of it is, is getting this started and literally putting our money where our, where our mouth is. So I think it's doesn't, anybody and everybody. Doesn't that feel like the ultra ethos too? Very beautifully I said, do. Coop. I mean, I it's do, like, man. yeah, if you make your money in this sport, it's up to all of us to invest our hard-earned dollars to make sure that the overall health of the ecosystem lives on into the next generation in a in a really healthy and vibrant way and that would be a beautiful thing where do i, I where do i venmo my money to <laughs> <laughs> i i don't disagree with that i mean i think you're right i i you know we don't have every competitive athlete in the sport here on this podcast but i think if you were to ask them do you want a clean sport if you wanted to ask the coaches do you want a clean sport and a level playing field I can't imagine anyone saying, nope, don't want that at all. I mean, I think everyone everyone wants that, especially as the sport continues to grow and it gets more lucrative in a lot of ways. And we should all have skin in the game. Um, if, you know, if we don't have skin in the game, it, it's a lot easier to be tempted to, to cheat the system for, for some people. Um, and, you know, I think that makes everyone feel like they're also a part of it as well. So, well, so here's the challenge. We're already throwing it down. If you're in the space and you have the opportunity to help this whole thing out, put your money where your mouth is and do it. I think one of the things that came out of um, the conversation that I had with Charlie, which I know you guys haven't, haven't listened to you yet, but I've kind of given you the little bit of a rundown. Part of the reason that hasn't got traction isn't necessarily the financial side of it like i think they could initially bootstrap it and get that and get that piece of it together but there wasn't enough horsepower behind the whole effort so it takes money and willpower and if anything if i'm if we once again if we look back 10 years from now and nothing happens the biggest thing we're going to kick ourselves in the butts about is that we didn't have enough collective willpower because I think we can get the funds together initially. I'm, I'm not concerned on the financial side. I think people will put their money where their mouth is. Like you mentioned, Dylan, it's part of the ultra ethos to all chip in and help each other out. But let's let's not mince any words here. Doing something like this is an incredibly difficult, thankless job that doesn't pay shit and is rife with criticism. Who wants that? Like, that's what it kind of comes down to. Like, who wants the job of organizing this? Yeah, nobody's <laughs> speaking out here and I've got my finger Freaking on awesome. my nose for those of you watching the YouTube version. Yeah. I mean, that's it's basically, so I, the, the digital version of that was happening in Charlie Ware's email group, in which I was a part of. Uh, he yeah. sent it to people who had finished top 10 in Ultra Run of the Year and people who had finished top 10 at Western States. And he had taken a lot of the initiative and it came to a point where sort of somebody had to take the leadership role and do the hard work. And 
everybody's busy, you know, everybody's got other stuff going on. Nobody's the one that, uh, wants to step, step up to the plate and, and take that thankless job. And, um, that's a hurdle we'll have to cross eventually. You know, my, my very good friend, um, John Frothingham, who was USADA's, uh, COO, and he would not mind me mentioning this, this, this story either. Um, who was really influential on USADA's development in kind of the early 2010 timeframe. He booted up the UFC program and things like that. Um, when I initially talked to him about this, maybe four or five years ago, he said, here's your failure point, Coop. Nobody's going to want to do the job. Everybody is going to get super enthusiastic because they all want it to, you know, Mario's point earlier. If you ask everybody, do you want a clean sport? Do you want a level playing field? Everybody's going to say yes. You're going to be able to get people on board conceptually, but you still have to have a ringleader who's going to drive all of the nuts and bolts and cross all the T's and dot all the I's home. And that is a thankless shit job that is rife with, with criticism because everybody thinks it needs to be done a little bit differently and it's not going to pay anything. And who's going to want to take that up when everybody's busy with other stuff. I'm not saying that it's impossible, but I do think to our earlier point, that's the pinch point, right? That's mm -hmm. the pinch point. And this whole thing is the collective will. And then the will of what I would envision is a few select individuals to get something like this, not only to the start line, but across the, across the finish line, Charlie's got to the start line. It's good framework. Mm -hmm. It's getting it to the finish line and ultimately like implemented. That is going to be the, the, the huge, the huge, hu it's a human challenge, right? We get, it's a, it's a, it's a willpower type of challenge. So who does it that I didn't ask you guys to think about that question, right? <laughs> who does it? Like we can come up with all the theoretical, we, everybody pays for it and it's got integrity and things like that. At the end of the day, somebody's got to do the work. Somebody does, from the community got to raise their hand and say, Oh, I want this. I want this crap job that Coop just went through. <laughs> who, who actually tests for things, right? So I guess my question is like, I know there's been some efforts to do kind of like just have the athletes send their own samples in just in good faith, just to prove things proactively or whatever. But I guess to, to the question of like, who, who does the work? I, I guess we have to first understand like, how does testing actually even happen? Cause that's something that I don't really know myself. And, and so if, if it's as simple as, you know, we just do a, a simple crowd fund and then every week randomly pull a five different pros out of a hat and say, Hey, you're up, you know, send your sample to this lab um, or go to quest lab or whatever they're called. Um, like, is that, is that a model? <laughs> I don't know. Well, I mean, I think that's all TBD, right? I mean, but, we've, we've used, we've used USADA and USA cycling and USA triathlon is kind of the frameworks, but the reason that they're the frameworks is because they're the only, they're the only game in town. Now they use their own people, the accredited labs to send the samples to and things like that. I, that's a good solution. That's not the only solution out there. There are other, there are other anti-doping agencies. VADA is one of them. That's mm -hmm. pre, that's kind of prevalent in the combat sports, particularly out on the West coast that has a different, very similar, but it's a different or similar framework, but different, uh, different organization. And, but I guess my point with that Dylan is, is there's a lot of, to answer your question, there's a lot of different mechanisms for how to do the testing and the governance and the sanctioning process and things like that. There's a lot of different frameworks out there that you can kind of pull from, from things that exist. At the end of the day, somebody's got to look at that landscape and say, okay, here's the proposal. Let's get everybody on board. Here's what I think, here's what I think that we should do. That, that, that person, it's kind of got to emerge out of nowhere. You know, I mean, Charlie took it on his own shoulders to, to do it through, I didn't even ask him what his motivation point was, but I don't think he knew what he was getting himself into, but a person or a core group of people is something that has to emerge to really get it to, to really establish those things. Yeah. It's not easy is, so, is the point I'm trying to make. Right. Yeah. So as you say that, I mean, it feels like a job for more than one person too. It feels like it needs to be kind of a small team who's managing the logistics and then 
the sanctioning and the sanctioning obviously is a very sensitive thing where there would have to be some consensus as well about what the penalties are, what they should be, when you can come back. Because I don't know, one of the things that I think is, is interesting is just culturally, and this I think is our greatest savior at the moment where the anti-doping thing is concerned is that if you are cheating, you're basically excommunicated from the sport. Um, within trail and ultra running. I mean, we saw what happened at the North face 50, a bunch of years ago where, uh, Lisa Desco who had failed, uh, a, a doping test and served a suspension came and raced TNF 50. And there's basically like protesters on the course. You know, I think culturally people are very averse to welcoming in people who have been found to break the rules. And I think that's a preventative step, though that's not going to be sufficient to keep the sport clean forever. But then you look at the UFC where you have the example of uh, TJ Dillashaw is his name. Remember him, Coop? He yeah. was, a, oh, yeah. he, he was been a following the story, man. <laughs> world, he's but was world champion, uh, yeah. just an absolutely phenomenal fighter. Uh, one of those, you know, 125 pound, 135 pound, just powerhouses. And he was known for having like incredible endurance. Right. And then he pops positive for EPO, like super right. high octane shit. And it's like, well, and he's known for having a, a, an engine and he's the world champion, right? But culturally within the sport, it, it's not the same, right? Like he will come back and fight when his suspension's over and it, the, and the people will love him. And, and the sport will support it. I think that's totally not yeah. the case with ultra running. And so I think that is, is definitely something that uh, we can hang our hats on knowing that, you know, that that's a disincentive, though not, not something that uh, will keep us safe forever, as I said. Dylan, what do you think about, I mean, this is off topic, but it's going to be relevant at a certain, it already is relevant. It's going to be more and more relevant, I think. What do you think about the crossover athletes? Because we are going to have crossover athletes from cycling and from triathlon and maybe even from running that have had some run in. Lisa was a great example that, that kind of just happened, but it's only, I think it's only going to go up from there. Mm -hmm. That's a benign case yeah it's only going to go up it like it's only going to get more controversial where you have somebody that is currently serving a four-year ban for whatever and then starts entering races what what do you think about that as an as an athlete so it's complicated i, I would say first and foremost i'm a definitely a big believer in second chances i volunteered for a bunch of years inside of a prison have become friends with guys who have committed violent crimes and who are at their core, good people, and they deserve a second chance. I believe that's the case in every aspect of life. That being said, I can't say that I don't respect Western States' position to protect the sanctity of their race, to say, if you've ever had to serve a doping ban or tested positive, you're not welcome in this race. There's other races that you can do, but you're not welcome in this race. I feel like that is their prerogative as an organization to have that position, even though I am a believer in second chances. But to the crossover athlete question, I, I think this is going to be something that we will have to deal with. And actually I was running this morning with my friend, Andrew Bumbelo here, who's recently retired uh, Nike athlete pro marathoner. He was a 5k, 10k guy before that, uh, an amazing runner an awesome guy. And we've talked many times about over the course of his career, him being able to point to races where guys have either tested positive who've beaten him or who he's just very, very suspicious about. And I just feel so grateful in my career that I can't look at a single race where I've lost and come up short by a small amount or whatever, and thought that guy is suspicious. And I think that's an absolute gift and uh, something that I should be enormously grateful for because it's really sad that unfortunately Bumby has to be somewhat skeptical, cynical about uh, some of the people that he's raced in his career. But this is the big question as we move into um, the future of the sport when there will be real financial incentives and we might start seeing people coming in from other sports where maybe the culture is not like it is in trail running. Um, 
And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, the, it's going to be a, a hard problem to solve. And, and that's why, as we've talked about, it's better to get in front of it before that becomes an issue. Well, yeah, the, the I, analogy... I think that's go ahead, Mario. I was going to say, I think that's exactly right because track and field is just so far ahead of ultra running in that regard. And what Bumby was describing, I don't want to say it's going to be the norm 10, 20 years from now, but especially if nothing's done, there are going to be more professional athletes who are wondering about who beat them in a given race. I, I mean, it's just, it's inevitable, I think. Um, and then to the topic of the crossover athlete, the first thing I thought of, this was probably, I think it was like 2015, 2016. It's almost like the ultimate example. You had Lance Armstrong who entered the like Woodside 50K. And then I think there was another race up here in Marin that he was going to run. And then he was pacing his buddy at Western States. And I mean, he's a very polarizing figure as it is. But there were a lot of people in the community who were like, he has no business being here because he cheated to win all his Tour de France titles. And then you had people who were like, well, he's not even going to be a factor. So why should we, you know, why should we even care? And that's a, that's a tricky situation. I, yeah. I don't know that there's a, there's an easy answer to that. I mean, I, you know, I agree with Dylan and like Western States and, and events. I mean, it's their prerogative to say like, Hey, if you've ever tested, you, you know, in another sport, like you've tested positive in service suspension, like you're not welcome here. Um, I don't know that every race has to take that, that stance, but I'm supportive of them if they do. Um, World Marathon Majors has that policy. I mean, if you've served any sort of suspension, you you are not welcome in the elite field at a World Marathon Majors race. Um, That's the that difference, may... though. It's the elite field in the World Marathon Majors. In Western States, it's everybody. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I, it that's, may, it that's may be in the race off, itself, but that's, but that's the the biggest issue yeah. I had, not the, not the biggest issue, but one of the biggest issues I have with the Western States race is you have this sport that is culturally very accepting, right? We love people from all walks of life, right? It's just a very accepting, a very accepting sport. You have somebody who tested positive for something in table tennis 20 years ago, and you're telling them they can't run the Western States 100? Like that inconsistency or incongruity with the culture, I have a hard time wrapping my head out, wrapping my head around. Once again, admirable. I realize that they're kind of planting a very hard flag in the ground. And there's a lot of right, they have every right to, to, to do so. But I think the maximalist way of doing it, of saying irrespective of any sport in any level of sanction, you are never, ever welcome to come run our race is bad policy to put forth when you're in a leadership position. That's my overarching thing is that mm. it's a maximalist policy from a leadership position because you can't change. The only way you can change is to get more lenient. Like, I just think that's a horrible corner to back yourself to, to like back yourself into anyway, there's a monologue in another podcast that can go <laughs> all through that. So the listeners will have to refer to, 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 to that one. I asked for the record. I'll say it again. I gave Western States the opportunity to comment on this in any way, shape or form that they wanted to. They gave me a statement to read and I read it during the Lisa Roberts uh, uh, podcast. So the listeners can kind of go refer to that. So continue on before I, uh, before I interrupted you, Mario, with your train of thought there. I lost my train of thought right there. Um, <laughs> but, but that. you know, but I mean, I think this is, but to something we said earlier, I mean, I think if you were, this is where I disagree with you, you a little bit in terms of having a harsh policy that can only get more lenient. I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad way to go. I, th I think it's tougher to go the other way to have a real lenient policy that all of a sudden you make extremely harsh. But I think if you have a harsh policy in place, at least initially, and it becomes clear like, hey, this doesn't work for every situation, then you can figure out like what situations it does work in and that it's applicable toward. And then where you have to be like, okay, well, for someone who is not in the elite field and, and maybe this is like 
you know, as the sport becomes more professional, like maybe this is something that needs to happen in higher level trail and ultra distance races where it's like, Hey, this is the elite field. Like there's a very clear boundary, like who's, who's in there. And I mean, there's, there's, there's debate about that. Like when you have people, yeah. you know, can you win the, I mean, the Boston marathon went to a separate elite start to basically, you know, eliminate this possibility of like, you know, someone being able to win from behind, but maybe you need to have like a, a clear designation for an elite athlete so that you can say like, Hey, it is not tolerated here. But if you're just going to to participate and, you know, you, you are open to retesting and, you know, you've you've done everything right and, and you deserve that second chance, that opportunity, like I'm fine with that. But I, I feel like you almost have to start with like a harsh policy and then and then figure out like, OK, well, where does it not need to be so harsh? Yeah, I we're going to have to disagree or agree to That's disagree fine. on that one, because I, I think that from a policy perspective, when you start, you have to try to th thread through the middle versus trying to be on the edges of the bell curve. Because I think that the maximalist policy of any infraction in any sport at any point of your career results in a lifetime ban from this particular race is just as maximalist as just let everybody compete dope to the gills, right? Those are the two maximalist positions in, in anti-doping. Any result results in a lifetime ban or let everybody dope free and just kind of compete. I don't think that you should start policy from either one of those endpoints. You have to start somewhere in between them. Now that could be more harsh or more lenient or whatever, but you, I just think from a pot, like an overall policy perspective in anything, you never start at one of the endpoints and try to work your way up or down. You start in the middle and then adjust as the situation goes along. That's my personal take on it. And we're we're gonna we're we're gonna end up with a five hour podcast if we keep going down that rabbit hole. <laughs> well, I think we both we both agree that there needs to be adjusting that you're yeah. open to. It's just where is where is that starting point? And we could definitely debate that another time. It's hard because everybody wants no, I wouldn't say everybody wants, but most reasonable people most reasonable people want harsher sanctions but they need to be balanced with the athletes rights who have made a legitimate mistake. And that happens, that happens a shit ton, like way more than most people realize. Athletes run afoul of the rules. They're not intending to. And the really unfortunate part is the athletes who do that and the athletes are cheating have the exact same excuses. And it's hard for the lay person to determine and all the lay people just want to like throw, you know, throw criticism around things like that. It's almost impossible for the lay person to determine that person was actually cheating or no, that person is not. It's almost a smell test. And it's very, very, very difficult for the public to kind of decide, decide between those two, because the presentation of the people that are cheating are ex is exactly like the people that are not cheating. I got, you know, I was prescribed this medication, my whatever was contaminated. Uh, Dr. Fedoric in the podcast that, that, that I just recorded with him said, oh, I had sexual contact with this person and resulted in a, it resulted in a positive test. I mean, all those situations come up with both people that are trying to manipulate the rules as well as the people who genu genuinely had no Made an honest mistake. Intent. Right. Did you see the one in horse racing? Oh God! Just a few oh, days ago, oh, the the, the horse tested positive. Oh, yeah, that's a <laughs> and shit the, show, And man. the trainer, who is like the <laughs> Baffert, legendary total, trainer total ever, now show. his reputation is gonna is uh, teetering show. because uh, he said that the horse ate hay that a different yeah. doped up horse had peed on. <laughs> total, is a total shit show, man. <laughs> like. You talk, you talk, we talked earlier about the UFC having problems when they instituted uh, doping controls. Horse racing actually had more, way more. Yeah. It's a hmm. really, really, really dirty sport. Really hmm. dirty sport. Kind of rife with all of the cultural things that went on in cycling times 100. But anyway, yeah. we're going to have to end it there, guys. Um, th <laughs> thank you guys for coming on, man. I know there's a lot of banter. Um, I, I do hope that at the end of the day, the community starts to galvanize partially through the some of the content that I've mentioned on the last uh, several podcasts, but partially on their own accord. I mean, I encourage people after listening to this, have conversations with your friends, colleagues, sponsors, brands, um, 
race directors, anybody who is vested in the long-term health of the sport needs to come to the table and start to proactively make solutions or, and create solutions because nobody's going to do it for us. We're going to have to do it ourselves. And if we can get that started with just the three of us on this humble podcast, hopefully it's a good start. Just start sending money to Debo's Venmo account. <laughs> yeah, there we go. We're going to publish Debo's. <laughs> that will be in the show notes. And Debo <laughs> can collect all the money and only siphon off a little bit of it. <laughs> and coin, yeah. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Thanks, you guys. I really appreciate it. Um, any, any final notes, Dylan? No, Coach, thanks so much uh, for taking the leadership position on this. Uh, I'm really looking forward to listening to the entire series. Mario also great to have another awesome discussion with you. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic with good people like you guys in the sport that we can find a solution. Yeah. Thanks Coop for hosting this conversation. Hopefully it spurs further conversa conversations throughout the community amongst all the, the stakeholders there that you just mentioned, because as Dylan and I talked about in his podcast this week, like the the sport is definitely at a turning point. It, it's undeniable and it's only going to, get more professional from here. And I think, you know, anti-doping um, is certainly a, a key component of that. And we need to get ahead of it before it steamrolls us, you know, 10 years from now, as we've talked about throughout this episode. Very well said, Mario. Appreciate the heck out of both of you guys. And uh, yeah, man, we'll do it again soon. All right, folks, there you have it. That's it. That's the end of the series of podcasts about anti-doping solutions in the sport of ultra running for now. I'm sure it will come back up later. Maybe Western States will take me up on the offer to come back on the podcast and talk about this a little bit. Who knows? Um, special thanks to all the guests that I have had over the course of the last five weeks. I realize that it's time and effort out of your day. And I also realize that sometimes it comes with a little bit of angst. And that is Dr. Matt Fedorik over at USADA, Paul Dimio, Lisa Roberts, Charlie Ware, and finally, the two guests of this podcast, Dylan Bowman and Mario Fraioli. I hope this podcast has, this, this series of podcasts has been both informational as well as inspirational to a number of you because I want people to come together and to put the work into finding a solution like this. I'm willing to partake in that, absolutely. That's why I put these series of podcasts together. I'm willing to absolutely help in the solution. And as a special surprise right now that I determined yesterday I was gonna do, yesterday before I recorded this podcast, I was gonna do, to ping off of an element that Dylan and Mario mentioned during the course of the podcast of would we pony up? Absolutely, 100%. I'm gonna pony up, I'm gonna put my own bucks down for this. I'm gonna allocate $10,000 out of my personal operating budget. I'm an independent contractor, I own my own business, I've gotta run the show, I've gotta pay my contractors, pay people to produce this podcast, pay people to edit the book that's gonna come out eventually and all these other things. I'm gonna take 10 grand from that, I'm gonna set it aside, I'm gonna lock it in a box, and whenever a solution gets formed, that's gonna be part of the seed money. That's my promise to the community. I'm gonna be, you know, hopefully one of the first on the ground for that. I don't expect anything in return, but I put my money where my mouth is. I'm not just gonna, just gonna sit here on the other end of the mic opining on stuff. I'm actually gonna take action and be a part of the solution on every layer of the solution, including the financial one. So there you have it, folks. There you go. I hope that also inspires people to get solutions together. Really appreciate the dialogue that we have had over the course of the last five weeks. I found it extremely reasonable across all areas, which is always enlightening. As always, folks, we will see you out on the trails.